I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell you what I told you. Uh, before we get to that scripture, let, let me tell you what we've been sharing for the last six weeks. So a lot of things that we shared. We started out in Samuel, and we've been there for a while. We've talked about Hannah giving birth to a little boy named Samuel. Samuel became a prophet. As a prophet, he laid hands on a man named Saul. Saul was the first king of Israel. It's important you catch this, because if you miss all this, you'll miss where we're going. But this has all been kind of, we haven't called it a series, but it's been like a series. So we've, we've had Hannah having this little boy. She wasn't supposed to have him. He hung, he hung out with Eli. Then all of a sudden, he, he, he went looking for it. God told him, go find another king because Saul's, he's not, the, he's not the right one. The people chose him. I didn't. And so they go, and they, he finds little David out in the field. And out of all the brothers, he was the one anointed as king. And, of course, he's illegitimate as a child. He's not the, he doesn't have the same mom as the other boys do, and that's probably why he was left outside. And then, of course, he became the giant slayer and the sweet psalmist of Israel. He had the heart of God, man. I mean, God loved this boy because he, he didn't need a crowd in order to uh, uh, entertain. He just wanted to entertain God. He just won't tell God how wonderful he was. And he wrote the Psalms, so many of the Psalms that we've read today. This Saul gets jealous of him, and he chases after him. And, and we don't have time to go into all the stories of David hiding in a cave and this, that, and the other, and feigning madness. But, but these are the things that happened in David's life. And, and it was just like survival. And I know some people say, well, you know, don't survive. You've got to go above that. Sometimes life is just about surviving. If I'm just surviving, he feigned madness, amen, in order to go hang out with the, the Philistines, the very people that he once had, had destroyed and killed and became a uh, double agent. They thought he was with them, and he was sneaking out and killing the enemy and sneaking back in, you know, that kind of thing. So it's, it's an amazing story. The Old Testament's bloody. Oh, it's bloody. You know, and again, you can't sugarcoat this or look after it. And then David became very close with a guy named Jonathan. Jonathan became his covenant brother. He loved Jonathan. They were connected. Now, Jonathan's daddy is Saul. Jonathan's a guy that, that had a sword and one time climbed a mountain with an armor bearer. Uh, again, the scripture of sugar. But he, he showed himself to the Philistines. Now, if I do this to you, you know what I'm talking about, okay? He, man, he showed himself to the Philistines. They got mad and said, y'all come on up here. And they crawled, crawled to the top of the mountain. They felt like that was God saying do it. And when they got there, they, they uh, annihilated the enemy again. So we see this, and then Jonathan and Saul get in a battle, a major battle, and they both are killed in the battle. David laments. He weeps over the death of Jonathan. He loved Jonathan. We talked about Jonathan last week. Jonathan had a son. His name was Mephibosheth. He was crippled at five years of age. At five years of age, the nurse fell on him after she heard that Jonathan's family and Saul's family had died. At that moment, we understand that, that after the death, uh, disabilities need not disqualify. Just because you've got a disability, it shouldn't disqualify you from doing something for God. Mephibosheth was separated. He lived in a place called Lodabar. We talked about this last week. And then, of course, they found him. David had covenant with Jonathan. And out of that covenant, he talked to him and said, you know what? I'll do whatever you want me to do. Jonathan said, don't forget me. Don't cut my seed off. Don't cut my family off. They found Mephibosheth. And, of course, he ate with the king's men. Amen. He ate with the king's sons and daughters. It was an amazing story on disabilities, and we see that taking place. And then, of course, we read about David being upon the, at a time when kings go forth unto war. David stayed home. When he stayed home, he looked over the balcony of his <sighs> palace, and he saw a beautiful woman in a bathtub. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time looking at the wrong thing. And all of a sudden, the hubba bubba came all over him. He couldn't seem to break it. He ended up with Bathsheba. Bathsheba ends up having a child. Then David tried to uh, cover it up. By doing that, he ended up executing or having one of his mighty men killed. His name was Uriah. Nathan the prophet came to David and he said, you the man. You did the wrong thing. David repented before God. You read Psalm 51, creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. You see David's heart again. He knew he'd done wrong, but he fell back on the grace of God. In so doing, after that, 
Every time you put that phone up on me, girl, I, I lose my train of thought. And that's my daughter. I know you're doing your job, but that still messed me up. And there he was, weeping and crying over a child that was born to Bathsheba, his first child. You can put the phone back now. This is important. <laughs> that little baby meant so much to David and Bathsheba. But God told David that this is a part of the judgment on your life. And he wept and he cried, and the baby died. And David took ashes and threw it on his head. And he pleaded with God for weeks, and the baby perished. David got up. He washed himself. He anointed himself. He changed his clothes. How do you get out of depression? Get up, shower, anoint yourself with some oil, get you some Crisco WD-40. I don't care what it is. Anoint yourself. That's right. Shake it off and get ready and go to the house of God and worship. Amen. Believe, here's, the, here's the principle, and I've lived by this principle. Believe God for the best, accept the verdict. The best is that child will live. The verdict is I'll see that child again. And David said that child can't come to me, but one day I'm going to go see that child. And I live in such a way to know that there are people that I'm going to get to go. They can't come back and see me, but I'm going to get to go and see them. This week I saw my dad playing the banjo. My wife had found it on a recording from years ago. I gave Josiah Ramirez my dad's banjo. And Josiah came into my house and sat there and, and picked uh, uh, going up Cripple Creek. I know some of y'all ain't got no idea what Cripple Creek is, but that's a place up in Colorado that I know of. There's a Cripple Creek in every state, I think. There's Cripple Creek where I'm at. And the song goes, going up Cripple Creek, going in a run, going up Cripple Creek, have a little fun. And I knew the song. And Josiah sat there, that young Hispanic boy, and played my daddy's five-string banjo. Made me cry, man. Amen. It was like memories coming back all over me. And then my wife found my dad playing that band. And here I'm watching him on video. Take lots of video of good stuff. And pictures, you know, because we didn't have them when we, were, when we were kids. But you got them. You have that opportunity. And so now we find that David has, has realized the baby has passed. He believed God for the best, and he accepted the verdict. And then there was another child born to Bathsheba. He married her, and that child's name was Solomon. Amen. And he became the wisest man of the world, the book of Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastes, written by the man of Solomon. Now we find that David has three, three kids. He has several more kids, but he has three main kids, Tamar, Amnon, and Absalom. Now, here's the heartbreak. Amnon assaults his daughter, Tamar, is vicious and wicked. Absalom afterward pursues Amnon without Amnon even knowing it and murders his own brother in retribution for his sister, Tamar. See, I don't know if you've read your Bible lately, but there's a lot of stuff in here, boy. And it's, it's really kind of messed up. Then because none of the kids, it's totally dysfunction. You know, some of you worry about your family being dysfunctional. You ain't seen nothing yet. I mean, it gets dysfunctional. Then Absalom, as a grown man in his 30s, decides now I'm going to rebel against my father. He's not fought a battle. He's not killed a Goliath. He doesn't have a heart after God. And he begins to talk to people in the gate, and he gets people to get on his side. As they get on his side, there's a man by the name of Ahithophel. Now, don't try to say his name. I'm a professional. 2 Samuel chapter 17, verse 23, records this. When Ahithophel saw that his advice had not been followed, he saddled his donkey and set out for his house in his hometown. He put his house in order and then hanged himself. And he died and was buried in his father's tomb. Why did Ahithophel commit suicide? Why did he take his own life? Why would that happen? So I want to talk to you about that, and I'm going to give you one word, one word of why this man took his own life, and the word is bitterness. Bitterness. I've talked about bitterness quite often to you, but I started studying through this, and when I found Ahithophel, I thought, why would this guy do this? They just wouldn't even take his advice. Why would you take your life for that? And I'm going to walk you through it. And get you there. So it's kind of a study on where I've been. You should have, hopefully, one day you're going to start bringing your own Bibles. And start looking through it and marking in it and stuff. I go back to my old Bibles and I see I'm marking them and I take notes in them. I even do it on my phone now. I take notes in my phone. 
You know, because they're important to go back over and review. Now, when you talk about the word bitterness, you realize that it is a root. Everybody say root. You know, I'm not real good, Frank, but I know that I've been out to the garden. You guys are planting out at the ranch, and it's a beautiful garden. But I'm seeing weeds coming up. And they just, just come popping right up. And no matter how beautiful you've made the garden and whatever you've planted, you didn't plant those weeds. But them weeds come straight up. And the only way to get rid of that weed, you can chop the top off of it, but it doesn't get rid of it. You've got to pull it out by the roots. you got to take that thing all the way out. And that right now is a really good time because everything's nice and soft and wet. To get those roots out. But I want, to, I want to talk to you about that. The word bitterness, you know, the word is an adjective and it has the following definition. Strong and sharp in taste. When you've tasted something bitter, you have in your taste buds, you've got sweet, sour, bitter. So, I, you know, I, I, if I, if I, salty, the fourth one. So if I eat something salty, if I eat some potato chips, often right after that I've got to have a candy bar. Because this has something salty, but I want something sweet. And I'm trying to adjust that and eat more watermelon. Which is sweet, but if I eat watermelon, I got to put salt on it. Now you may not do that because because you're not country. I understand, but that's what I do. But it's so strong and sharp in taste, having a sharp, strong, unpleasant taste, uh, like an orange peel. Like you, you, you eat an orange peel. Yeah, some of you are so mean you give your children lemon slices just to watch them pucker. Amen. Because you're, you're testing their their bitterness early in life. A, a second, uh, resentful. Amen. Painful. Amen. Difficult to accept. Uh, hard to accept, bitter, uh, very cold when it's bitter. It's bitter, cold out, penetrating. We don't get that here in southeast Texas, but, but it does happen in places up north. Uh, cold, penetrating, unpleasantly cold. I, I'm interested in the word there in the second one, resentful. It has the idea of brooding anger over that which has happened in your life. This anger produces a bad spirit within a person. It's often the spirit of hostility and coldness toward God and others. Is where does it come from? Bitterness can come about as the result of what others do to us or say about us. Sometimes bitterness can result from the events of life themselves as we blame God or others for our own troubles. Bitterness will affect every relationship within your life, but it will affect your relationship with the Lord most of all. Bitterness, according to the book of Hebrews, and we've used this verse quite often because I see it, but it's also found in the Old Testament. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Paul said, see to it that no one fell short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. I speak to you about Paul the apostle because he was a man beaten. He was a man shipwrecked. He was a man bitten by a snake. He was a man who had been betrayed. He was a man who had gone through so many difficulties in life, and yet he remained without bitterness. And many of us, one little thing in our life can start causing a root of bitterness in us. Somebody said something about us, or we heard a rumor about us, or we saw something on social media about us. I saw stuff this week on social media about me. I don't try to defend myself. I let God do it. It's not my, you listen, it's not my, it's none of my business what you think about me. But sometimes if you write something, prepare yourself. Because <laughs> it always comes back on you. I mean, it always comes back. We, beware, because it's better to cover somebody with love than to spit out bitterness. I mean, bitterness is a terrible thing. I spent four and a half hours with somebody this week that many of you would be shocked that I was with because you think I should be bitter about it. I have no bitterness. I have no meanness toward it. I have, matter of fact, the, the older I get, the only thing that matters to me is getting me to heaven, getting you to heaven, getting my kids to heaven. My daughter was going through some stuff. And I said, Mandy, the bottom line is this. The issue is this is temporary. You know, that, that song you did, that last song, reminds me, Pastor Joseph, that, that you know, there's, <laughs> I'm waiting on heaven to open. I'm believing God for the, the good things to come. These bodies are aging. Now, I'm going to enjoy all the heaven I can here on earth. So I'm going to keep riding my Harley. Amen. I'm going to keep uh, pursuing life and enjoying life. And if I get a chance to jump out of another plane, I'm going to do it. I hope you're with me. I'd rather jump out of a plane than go down with one. Amen. Deuteronomy, now you go back to the Old Testament, Moses talking. Amen. Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 18, make sure there is no man or woman, clan or tribe among you today whose heart turns away from the Lord our God to go and worship the gods of those nations. Make sure there is no root. There it is again. There is no root among you that produces such bitter poison. So when I read what Paul said, it must it tells me, you know, Paul was a, 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 a Pharisee. He understood the first five books of the Bible. So he knew this scripture, and he understood that bitterness would get hold of your life, and it can become a root that gets down inside, and it defiles many. You can't stay bitter by yourself. It doesn't happen. 
Amen. It begins to affect other people. You affect people because you matter. People love you. You have influence. People care about you. People have invested in you. And if you allow bitterness to get into your life, you affect them. And if you're a family member, it affects family. So beware of bitterness. Can I get an amen? amen. It's called a root because it's hidden. We, down in the soil of your heart, from there its roots will entwine themselves around your heart and mind until you, they choke the life out of you emotionally and spiritually. And if allowed to grow unchecked, the root of bitterness will spring up. And as a plant, it's going to cast a shadow over everything you are and everything you do in your life. My friend, this root will literally come to dominate your very existence. You'll talk about it. You'll think about it. You'll go to sleep with it. You'll get up with it. So here here in our passage, we're presented with a man who was in a stranglehold of massive bitterness, a hithophil. He met a tragic end because he allowed a root of bitterness to flourish in his life. You know, what are we going to learn here? Let me tell you very quickly. First, Ahithophel's life was this. As his testimony, he was a saved man. Many things in this man's life give an indication that he had a love for God. 2 Samuel 15, 12 tells me, While Absalom was offering sacrifices, he also sent for Ahithophel, the Gilonite, David's counselor. We're going to talk about that again. To come from Gilho, his hometown, and so the conspiracy gained strength, and Absalom's followers kept on increasing. The very first time we see Ahithophel, he's sacrificing with, or we would call it worshiping, sac worship is sacrifice. That's why some people can't worship because they can't, they got to feel good to do it first. Everything got to be right first. Listen, most of the time when I worship, I don't feel like worshiping. Especially early on a Sunday morning when my eyes are trying to open. But I still get my worship on because it's not about me, it's about Him. It's an outward expression that I love him. He spoke for God. 2 Samuel 16, 23 says, Now in those days the advice of Ahithophel gave was like that of one who inquires of God. He was an oracle, would be the word of God. He was a conduit speaking for God. Both David and Absalom regarded all of Ahithophel's advice. So he had a reputation as a man who gave a good, godly counsel. In fact, this verse says, hearing a word from Ahithophel was like hearing a word from God himself. He had a testimony of a serving man. When you read about this man's life, it teaches us that he did not just believe in God, but he also served God by serving others. He was a counselor. We've already read this verse. It says he was one of David's counselors. Amen. When you have, uh, listen, if you're in leadership in any shape, fashion, or form, put people around you that are good counselors. Amen. That can give you good advice. Somebody that's been there. Ahithophel is quite a bit older than David. <laughs> when I get to the reason why he's better, you'll understand it. But this man, all of a sudden, he shifts in his thinking. He was a companion of God's man. Psalm 41, 9. How many times have I quoted this psalm, verses about what Jesus went through? Where Judas tripped Jesus up. We always talk about Judas tripping Jesus. This psalm says, even my close familiar friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread, has turned against me. This is a scripture that has a double fold. It has twofold meaning to it. In other words, in the New Testament, you look back to the scripture and say, that's talking about Judas and Jesus. But in the Old Testament, this is David writing about his counselor friend, Ahithophel. It was Ahithophel, his someone who trusted somebody he was familiar with, had turned against him. That word friend comes from a word that can be translated a champion, a husband, somebody that I have a great trust in, if you would. Amen. The word familiar comes from the same root word that is also translated peace. In other words, when I walk with this man, I have peace. There are certain people you get around you feel peaceful about, don't you? You just like being around them. I just, when I'm around you, I feel peace. And there's certain folk that just cause a doggone disturbance. Huh? Come on. Give me an amen. amen. You know it. When they show up, knock at your door, oh, it's, oh, dear God. Oh, hide. <laughs> Don't tell me you ain't never done it. You, you sneak around, you grab the dog's mouth and hold it. So nobody knows you in the house. You know what I'm talking about. But this man brought peace into David's life. And now he said he's turned against me. He was a counselor for David for nine years. Nine years he counseled with David. It hit the field, and it was closer than brothers. Their hearts were welded together as one that walked with God. So in spite of the fact that Ahithophel gave every outward indication that all was well between himself and the Lord and between himself and David, there was something working in his heart. 
There was something deep down inside of him that would destroy him. Even during these times of his life, Ahithophel has been eaten alive from the inside out by an event that happened earlier in his life. I want to point out something to you, to all of us. And I know people say, you know, how can this happen, Pastor? No, no one here in this church has got a root of bitterness. We're all in church. After all, you know, we, we, we smile during worship, we're joyous, and we're, we're together, and everything's all right. You cannot always tell from the outward signs what is happening in a person's heart. That's why I preach this. I, to me, that's why I even titled it, It Can Kill You. I have seen more people swallowed up by root of bitterness and affected in family. I've seen marriages, just as long as I live, there will be divorces. There will be people separating. There will be children rising against parents. How do I know that? Because the book of Timothy tells me so. The Bible tells me that in the last days, people are going to be scoffing at one another, and kids will rise up against their parents, and, and we're going to have issues in life, and there's going to be problems, and there's going to be rebellion. How do you handle that as a believer? You can't allow bitterness to own you. You've got to get rid of the tragedy of Ahithophel's life that it was hidden inside of him. It was a, a conspiracy. When Absalom rose up against David, Ahithophel saw his moment, and he went over and connected with Absalom. Now, pay attention. Amen. It was, it's tragic. When David's son, Absalom, rebelled against his father, Ahithophel saw his chance to enact revenge upon King David. Ahithophel joined the rebellion, and he stood against God's anointing. 2 Samuel 15, 31. Now, David had been told Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. So David prayed, Lord, turn Ahithophel's counsel into foolishness. What a heartbreak to be a king, to be anointed by Samuel, the prophet. The prophet's dead now. When your pastor passes... And this is what happened. Samuel was David's pastor. He was his seer. He was the one he talked to. He was the one he went to for advice. Samuel's gone now. And David is standing there having to deal with a situation in his heart. And he realizes that he never went after Saul. He never pursued Saul. When Saul tried to kill him, David would not raise up against the anointed of God. He wouldn't kill him. He waited, and when Saul died, he lamented the death of Jonathan and Saul. Now his own son has rose up against him, and what is David going to do? And I'm going to give you the answer, nothing. It looks like David ought to fight against him. Now his men do fight against Absalom's men, but David don't want to do it. When you read David's life, he's even saying, when you fight against Absalom, be gentle with him. Don't hurt him. He's my son. I know that he killed Amnon. I know what Amnon did to Tamar. I know what a mess this thing has been. I know what happened with Bathsheba. I know about the death of the child. But listen, my heart is still after God. Everything about me tells me I love God with all my heart. And here he is in a place in the kingdom. You know what he says we're going to do? We're going to leave the kingdom. We're going to leave this palace. We're going to go out of here. So David takes his men and they all leave. Absalom's rose up against David, and he's got people on his side now. This kid ain't even fought a battle. This boy ain't done nothing worthy to be other than to get people on his side. He's divided the kingdom. You know what David's thinking? Let him have it. You want it that bad? You go ahead and take it. God gave it to me. God wants me to keep it. He'll make sure I keep it. See, this is the right attitude. This is the right spirit to have. So David walks away from it, and the hit the field gets involved. And out of his hatred for David, he gave Absalom some words. When David left the palace, he left ten of his concubines. Now, again, the Bible don't whitewash this. Do I have to define concubine for you? Everybody understand what the word means? Please don't say no. <laughs> I'll have Pastor Joseph explain it to you. <clears throat> So David leaves 10 of his concubines behind. This is, the, this is the king's prerogative. This is what goes on, you know. That's why it'd be a whole issue with Bathsheba. God would have gave him Bathsheba. He already told him that. God, the prophet said, I'd have gave you Bathsheba. The issue is you killed Uriah. There's the issue. There's the problem. So here we find it that David leaves 10 of his concubines, so Ahithophel gives a word of advice to him. 2 Samuel chapter 16, what should I do? Ahithophel, what should I do? And this is what he said. Absalom said to Ahithophel, give us your advice. What should we do? Ahithophel answered, sleep with your father's concubines, whom he left to take care of the palace. Make sure you take plenty of pictures while you're doing it. 
post them on social media, and then all of Israel will hear when you have made yourself obnoxious to your father. And the hands of everyone with you will be more resolute. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof, and he slept with his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. You talk about wicked, bold, malicious. Now, in those days, the advice that hit the field gave was like that one of the, that inquires of God. So by having Absalom go into his father's concubines, he publicly disgraced David and created a rift between the father and the son. It can never be healed now. This thing can't be resolved. Then there's more advice he gives. A second recommendation, he said to him, 2 Samuel 17, 1, Ahithophel said to Absalom, I would choose 12,000 men set out tonight in pursuit of David. I would attack him where he is while he's weary and weak. I would strike him with terror, and then all the people with him will flee. I would strike down only the king and bring all the people back to you. The death of that man you seek will mean the return of all people. All the people will be unharmed. This plan seemed good to Absalom and to all the elders of Israel. This advice, had it been followed, would have been the death of David. It would have been the end of the kingdom. And Absalom, well, look here. Then Absalom would have become a Saul, a tyrant. See, what happens is, you watch, watch leaders. Watch leaders around the world. Please watch them. Watch how they do things. You know, we're a little different in America. We're screwed up. But other places in the world. Watch, watch what happens. A man finally becomes a leader. Then he tries to make himself a dictator. In order to stay the leader, he has to become a tyrant. He has to lead by fear. David led by heart. He led by example. He led by being, he was not afraid to go out and fight. He was not afraid to lead the people. He was a worshiper of God. He, he cared for God. He guarded the Ark of the Covenant. Everything about David spoke of the tenderness that he had toward God. And he loved his kids. He just didn't know how to deal with them all the time. Anybody can give me an amen with that? So the conclusion hits here. Thankfully, David had a true friend in Absalom's court, a man by the name of Hushai. Hushai, I love that name. Had originally planned to go with David when he fled from Absalom, but at David's request, he stayed behind in the city to try and overthrow the council of Ahithophel. So watch this. 2 Samuel 15, 32. When David arrived at the summit, where people used to worship God. Hushai the archite was there to meet him. He tore his robe, dust on his head. It shows that he's lamenting. David said to him, if you go with me, you'll be a burden to me. You ever looked at somebody and said, if you stick with me, you're going to bother me? If you stay with me, it's going to cost me. <laughs> Amen. You're going to be a burden to me. But I'm going to tell you something, Hushai. But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, your majesty, I will be your servant. I was your father's servant in the past, but now I will be your servant. Then you can help me by frustrating Ahithophel's advice. So Hushai becomes a spy, amen, in, into the place of Absalom, and he professed loyalty to him. Now, again, he's a spy there, 2 Samuel 16, verse 16. Then Hushai, the archite, David's confidant, went to Absalom and said to him, Hey, long live the king. Hey, you want to get on the king's good side? Long live the king. They always said that, amen, amen. Long live the king. Next verse. Absalom said to Hushai, so this is the love you show your friend? If he's your friend, why didn't you go with him? So now he's not even calling David his father. He's just a friend. Hushai said to Absalom, no, the one chosen by the Lord, by these people, and by all the men of Israel, this I will be, and I will remain with him. Furthermore, whom shall I serve? Should I not serve the son? Just as I served your father, so I will serve you. And after he had gained Absalom's confidence, Hushai contradicts the wise counsel of Hithophel. So the question came up like this, 2 Samuel 17, 5. But Absalom said, summon also Hushai. So what did Ahithophel said? We're going to attack David. We're going to kill just David. That's what we're going to do. So then he asked, he asked Hushai, he said, what do you think? He got a little more advice. You remember what David prayed? He prayed that God would... Conflict, Ahithophel's advice. Amen. Turn it against him. But Absalom said, summon all, also Hushai the archite so we can hear what he has to say as well. When Hushai came to him, Absalom said, Ahithophel has given this advice. Should we do it? What's your opinion? Verse 7. Hushai replied to Absalom, the advice Ahithophel has given is not good. Hmm, that's a bold statement. You know, your father and his men, they're fighters. And as fierce as a wild boar, a wild bear robbed of her cubs. Besides, your father is an experienced fighter. He will not spend the night with the troops. That resulted in Absalom accepting Hushai's counsel and David being warned of what is about to take place. 
And thus David is spared, of course. The key verse, 2 Samuel 17, verse 14, and I'll start closing here. Absalom and all the men of Israel said, The advice of Hushai, the archite, is better than that of Ahithophel. For the Lord had determined to frustrate the good advice of Ahithophel in order to bring disaster on Absalom. God was behind it all. He never left the scene. He was given. See, this is our prayer as we move as a nation. God, whatever it takes, frustrate the advice of bad advisors to our leaders. Frustrate it. God was behind it. Amen. It happened this way. The David's being left out. Absalom started the attack, and David's men routed Absalom. Absalom gets his hair that is so thick that he has to have it cut every year because it was, it was weighty on him. He is on a donkey, and he gets in the woods, and he runs under a tree. His hair gets caught up in the tree, and he's hanging there, and the donkey runs out from under him. And somebody reports it to Joab, the commander. And Joab has been told, and Abishag, the other commander, do not harm this boy. Be gentle to him. Instead, Joab takes spears, little darts, and pierces the heart of Absalom. You may tell people, don't allow this to bother you. This was said about me. Be careful what you tell other people because sometimes they get mad for you. I had to tell folk, settle your stuff down. I ain't upset. Why are you upset? I ain't bothered by it. Why are you bothered by it? Let it go. I don't want you hurting somebody else because something happened to me. Joab run the spirits through him and he died. Word got back to David and he lamented. He wept. Even though he won the battle, he wept. He cried. Joab goes in and tells David, quit crying. Go out there and celebrate with the men or they're all going to leave you. And David had to go sit out there as a father, but more as a king. And allow the men to celebrate the victory. This is hard stuff in Scripture. And you keep reading. And Ahithophel saw that his advice had not been followed. He saddled up his donkey. He set out for his house in his hometown. He put his stuff in order. And he hung himself. I have to ask the question. Why would this man turn against David? Nine years resentful. The idea of brooding anger over that which has happened in your life. What happened in Ahithophel's life? Now I'm going to tell you. Ahithophel was Bathsheba's grandpa. Hmm. He had an issue with what happened with Bathsheba, Uriah, the death of that great grandson. It got inside of him and he never let it go. Nine years he conspired. He acted like David's friend. But when he had an opportunity, he split from him and he joined Absalom. He was the grandpa. Family is hard, isn't it? Life can be tough. I knew this was going to be a tough message. That's why a lot of folk ain't here today. They couldn't handle this today. You know that. Wait till I get that bunch out there in New Caney. Boy, they really going to struggle. Bitterness is such a mean thing. How it affects us. The Hithfield did all these evil things because there was a root of bitterness in his life. He hated David and had merely pretended to be his friend all those years. And as the root of bitterness grew in his life, the Hithfield lost sight of his former friendship with David. He lost sight of his walk with the Lord. Everything of value in his life had been choked out, and he was left with nothing but bitterness and hatred. Amen. And because of that, it consumed him, and he took his own life. People are affected by this root because of some events in our past because of what someone said to you or about you because you didn't get your way at some point your feelings are hurt nothing means as much to you as getting your pound of flesh you're angry someone else and you want revenge you're hurt you want them hurt hurting people hurt people anger always assassinates authority 
you're offended, so you, you give them the cold shoulder, purposely go out of your way to avoid having to speak to them. You think you are hurting them, but in reality, you're hurting no one but yourself. How many times have I walked into a, a, an academy or a Walmart and I see a former friend or member whose bitterness has settled in, not because of me, but because of somebody else, and I'll watch them try to skirt me and walk away from me while I yell, woo It's a tremendous tragedy when saved spiritual people allow their lives to be consumed by hate, anger, and bitterness. The best thing you can do is build a bridge and get over it before it kills you. We got midweek coming up Tuesday night, 7 o'clock here. I'm going to finish this message Tuesday night. I'm going to talk you. I'm going to help talk your way out of bitterness. Amen. Get you out of this thing so that you don't have to live it. I don't want it to kill you. Past events must be forgotten. What happened yesterday can never be changed. But you hold the key to tomorrow. You should never allow the hurts of yesterday to control your life today. It's a shame when we drag around the baggage of what someone said, what someone did, or how we were hurt. It does nothing but strangle the spiritual life right out of you. Where we fail, he prevails. Where we fail, he prevails. Peter said, how many times must I forgive John? Seven times, seven, 49 times, which means that Peter was up to 48. <laughs> That's why he said it. And Jesus said, 70 times seven. It takes 490 times a day. Let it go. Why? Because if you don't, it's going to destroy you. Heads bowed, eyes closed. This one's on you this morning. You've got to make a decision today. I'm not going to ask you to lift your hand. I'm going to ask you to look inside. Those watching online, I'm going to ask you to look inside yourself. Have you allowed a root, something that you struggled? The Scripture says for me to leave a gift at the altar and go to, go to them. Go to that one. Go to him, not them. Not everybody else, but go to the one that's offended me, the one that, that hurt me. Let's talk this thing out. Let's deal with this. I'm not going to allow it to destroy my life. I want good fruits, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness in my life. I don't want a root of bitterness. Now, you have to pull that thing out. You can't cut it off. you got to pull it out. In the name of Jesus. Give us opportunities over the next few days, weeks, months, whatever it takes, Lord, to make sure that our lives are full of you, that joy will exemplify our lives and our smiles are not fake, that there'd be a love for you, and that our lives would be an example of somebody. Yeah, we know what they went through. We know the hurt and the pain and the separations and the, and the, the loss of, and yet they still got the joy of the Lord in their lives. God, allow us to do it as a body. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, 